Hey guys, it's me, Seren, back with another video. I know I was supposed to upload my Lovecraft Country episode one review yesterday, Saturday, but I was actually moving all day yesterday, so I didn't get a chance to do it. Um, it probably sounds really echoey in here because I'm actually in a new space, so you guys also are not going to see my dark walled bedroom anymore because I don't live there anymore. This is not my chair. I'm borrowing this chair. This room that I'm in right now is literally totally empty except for my desk because now I'm going to have a dedicated space to do my videos. This is the first time that I've had a dedicated space to do my videos and I'm really, really, really excited about it. So I'm happy to be doing my, my first video in this space as Lovecraft Country. Um, hopefully I'm able to get this video uploaded before Bees Bake, um, but if not, obviously you guys are going to be watching it clearly after Bees Bake, uh, and then episode two is going to come on tonight, Sunday at 9 p.m. So um, let's go ahead and get into Lovecraft Country in my new space. Apologies for the echo and she didn't hear yet. I was planning on doing this video in the good, the bad, and the ugly format, but I really didn't have any issue um, with this pilot, so there's kind of no bad and no ugly. <laughs> so I guess I'll kind of like go through it in terms of plot um, and some of the influences and some of the references that I noticed, but moving forward, I plan on doing these reviews in the good, the bad, and the ugly format. So I loved this episode one. I thought it was a really, really strong pilot. I thought the writing was excellent. Misha Green, who did Underground, so she's worked with uh, Journey before, was the, she's the showrunner, the executive producer, I believe, and the writer. And she might have directed this episode too. If that's incorrect, uh, please let me know in the comments. But I know she wrote it. And it's really interesting because I've seen a lot of people, you know, talking about Jordan Peele because his name is attached to the project as a producer. Uh, and a lot of this is sort of his um, genre, style, aesthetic, this idea of racism as horror, you know, as hard sci-fi, as horror. Um, but really, Misha Green wrote this, and she's amazing. I think her writing is incredible. I think what she did with Underground was really, really, really great, and, you know, God only knows why it got canceled. And obviously, she has a really good relationship with Journey Smollett. I think that they work well together. You know, you have some people that like working with certain actors, and they play off each other really well. And I'm really excited to see Misha you know, getting out there and doing her thing as a black woman, you know. I loved the black and white opening. We opened with this black and white scene, hard sci-fi scene, it's a war. And we see Jonathan Majors, who's our one of our main characters, uh, fighting in this war. It slowly, you know, became color over time. It was like an alien invasion, which immediately brought to mind for me Captive State, of course. You guys know I love Captive State. I did review it on the channel. Uh, Jonathan Majors and Ashton Saunders, Alien Invasion, with Jonathan Majors sort of leading the human resistance uh, against the aliens. So that came to mind immediately for me. Um, and it was just like some B-movie shit. Like, it started off wild as hell, campy as hell. It was serving men in black, a red alien girl came out of a, a spaceship, a UFO, and as she was coming down, my first thought was, why is she red? Like, she's certainly a princess of Mars. Like, what is that? And then, I don't know how you pronounce this, but Cthulhu, let me know how you pronounce it, who is the sort of quintessential, classic, love, crafty, and monster. It's sort of like an octopus dragon thing, attacks, and Jackie Robinson saves them with a baseball bat. Like, I was literally watching, like, the hell? Like, and then he just woke up, and I was like, wow, what a dream. Like, I really felt like that opening set the stage for the show. We had Jackie Robinson, you know, first Negro uh, baseball player. We had sort of this, this um, symbolism, I guess you could say, of war, of being black in America, of science fiction, of aliens, of violence, of all these things in a very quick intro. You know, if you if you didn't know what the show was about, even though, you know, and it was wild, campy, B-movie, like it literally looked like the girl was like painted bread. 
it looked very period, it looked very appropriate for the timeline. And so, you know, I feel like if you could only watch the first 10 minutes of the show, they managed to sort of give you a little bit of everything that the show was going to be about in that first 10 minutes. I thought they did a really excellent job with that opener. So Jonathan Majors wakes up. He's sleeping in the color section of the bus, which we see. They're in Kentucky. The bus breaks down. They get off the bus. He's sitting there reading a book. I'm thinking, what is he reading? What is he reading? They show it. It's a princess of Mars. It's fucking Edgar Rice Burroughs. And I said, I fucking knew that that red alien bitch coming out of that UFO was a fucking reference to a princess of Mars. I love a princess of Mars. I love John Carter. I thought that the movie John Carter of Mars was ahead of its time. And I kind of feel like it's criminally underrated. It got all these bad reviews, but I just think that it was ahead of its time and people didn't really get it. And it's really interesting because A Princess of Mars was written by Edgar um, Rice Burroughs in 1912. It's one of the sort of foundational texts of speculative fiction and especially like really hard sci-fi. A lot of the things that we see that have sort of become tropes even or, you know, just like standards of science fiction came from A Princess of Mars. A Princess of Mars was hugely influential on Star Wars from the promotional materials to a lot of the storylines, a lot of the ideas about, you know, and John Carter, like, John Carter could, like, leap over buildings in a single bound that became Superman, you know, a lot of of things from A Princess of Mars became foundational. If you're into sci-fi and speculative fiction, and as you guys know, I've been watching uh, Star Wars, finally, and the whole time I'm watching them, like, man, this is really reminding me of a princess of Mars. Like, Tatooine, this desert planet, kind of looks like Barsoom. And in terms like Sith, uh, Jeddak, Padawar, these are terms from a princess of Mars from Edgar S. Burroughs that turned up in Star Wars. And it's just like, once you, and it's just like one of those things that once you know, and once you notice, you really notice and you just can't stop seeing the influence everywhere. So it was really funny to me that they had like a direct reference to a princess of Mars. I felt like they, I'm going to get to this a little bit more later on, but I felt like they did such an excellent job of utilizing references in a really intelligent way, a really interesting way, a really clever way, you know, not just sort of like beating us over the head with the reference points. You guys know that this is a common issue that I actually have with Jordan Peele, his music selections, a lot of the choices that he makes seem like it's just like beating you over the head with the point. And I felt like I'm going to attribute this to Misha's touch. <laughs> I, feel, I felt like this is the first time that I saw some of those references done in a way that I felt was not too heavy handed. It was just like a very light touch, like a very light, a very light little sprinkling of references here and there, you know, little Easter eggs for you to catch. I thought it was done much better in this than in any Jordan Peele project that I've seen up until this point. Anyways, back to the scene, the bus breaks down. Of course, they're not gonna let the neighbors on the new bus. It's Jonathan Majors and this black woman. So they had to walk to the town, of course. Uh, he explains to her that he was reading A Princess of Mars, which is about John Carter, who's from Virginia. They always call him Virginia. He was a former Confederate soldier. And she says, like, oh, he's a, he was a Confederate. So he was, like, fighting in honor of slavery. So, it, again, right off the bat, we're getting this introduction to these ideas that you know are going to be the focal point of this show, right? Ideas about science fiction, ideas about pulp fiction, ideas about being a Black and especially a Black American science fiction fan, pulp fiction fan, you know, you love this stuff, you want to read it, you think the stories are so amazing and exciting and enticing, but then like the main character is the fucking Confederate or H.P. Lovecraft, who is another really foundational uh, sci-fi writer, I guess, you know, figure, that's what I want, figure, figurehead, but who was a virulent racist and who made up all of these ideologies about, he basically, he invented cosmic horror, Lovecraftian horror, which is the idea that, you know, the world is this vast sort of scary, huge place and your role as a human being is basically insignificant and that if you really understood the sheer horror, terror, and vastness of the world, you would lose your fucking mind, right? And the, and the monsters in it. But 
where that came from inside of H.P. Lovecraft was the fact that he was a virulent anti-black racist. The fact that he, you know, like, he hated blacks, hates niggers, hates Jews, hates women, hates, like, this man hated everyone. He hated New York. He hated cities. He saw the world, the real world, as a vast, terrifying, horrifying place full of niggers and spicks and women. And, you know, he ended up writing allegorically what became foundational cosmic horror. But it came from this place of, like, incredible racism. Like, it's really a mind fuck to think about. Again, especially as a genre fan, a sci-fi fan, a speculative fiction fan. And so we get this monologue from Jonathan Majors where he's explaining this. He's like, you know, I understand that John Carter is a Confederate soldier and that fucking sucks for me as a black American, you know? But my love of stories, he says, like, I have this love of stories. I love pulp stories, you know? I love it because, like, he gets to travel, you know, to a totally different place and be a hero and save the princess. And, you know, a black boy from the south side of Chicago doesn't get too many chances to be a hero. And then she says, unless he joins the army, which we already kind of are, are putting the pieces together now, like, oh, so his dream was... John Carter meets the army. He has this army experience. You know, we they really start setting the stage early, not with exposition, not with title cards and cues and things of that nature, but they're giving us dialogue. Y'all know I love, you know I love dialogue. Like, and they're giving us dialogue and they're giving us context clues and we're piecing this story together even though we just kind of got dropped into it. Love that. Uh, so he goes to see his uncle. And his uncle is, I wrote it down, his uncle is Courtney B. Vance. He goes to see his aunt and uncle, and his uncle is Courtney B. Vance, and his aunt is Anjanu Ellis. And I'm just watching like, yes, I know them. I love them. I love Jonathan Majors, as you guys know. Like, I love Journey, as you guys know. I think she's an amazing, incredible actress. Like, I really, and again, seeing that this is something that is set so deeply within, it's, it's clearly like rooted in the Black American experience. And, you know, we're going to get into, you know, sundown towns later on in this review. And we're going to get, we're obviously going to get really deeply into the Black American experience in the United States at this certain time period and the anti-Black racism towards Black Americans. I wonder if Misha Green had to, like, fight for these actors. Because y'all know, Jordan Peele hates putting a Black American, an actual Black American actor in a Black American role. Like, if this was being showrun and written by him, we would have, like, no Black Americans in these roles. And yet, like, the connection is, is, is there. Like, it's there as soon as you start watching. So, he goes to see his aunt and uncle. We learn, you know, through more dialogue that he joined the army to get away from his father and have his back because of him. His father's missing. His father is Michael K. K. Williams from, I want to say, The Wire, either The Wire or Oz. As soon as they showed him, they showed, like, flashbacks of them fighting. I was like, oh, I know him too. Like, I'm watching this shit like, oh, I know everybody in this, which I just, I love to see that, you know? Like, we learned that his aunt and uncle's names are George and Hippolyta Freeman, and that his uncle goes on trips to do reviews for a guidebook telling uh, Negro motorists where it's safe to go. It's called the Negro Motorist Guide. It's clear. It's clearly meant to be modeled after the Green Book, right? Which was a real life guide for Black Americans that wanted to travel by road during the segregated uh, Jim Crow era because there were obviously places where we could not go. We literally could not go because we would be lynched, we would be killed, we would be murdered, be it hotels, be it a whole entire town, cities, gas stations, restaurants. The Green Book um, Negro Motorist Guide, the real one, was meant to sort of tell where we could go, where it was safe. So immediately off the bat, this reminded me of Watchmen. I felt like it was serving a Watchmen aesthetic. I felt like, okay, so HBO has like a nice little niche here of them kind of doing this historical fiction. Like they're taking real things, real events, be it the Tulsa Massacre and Watchmen, be it sundown towns and Negro, you know, travel guides in um, Lovecraft Country, and they're sort of crafting these storylines around them. It's, it's wild to me the number of people that I saw, mostly white, saying, like, they never heard of Sundown Towns. I just, 
we we have such different realities. Like we have two different realities. Like we're really living in two worlds. It's really two Americas. Like they they don't know. Like they don't know anything. And what's funny to me is that these will be the same people that say like, oh, Black Americans haven't been through, you know, been through anything, or we need to let it go, or we need to get over slavery. Not even a white person said that. Acom said that very recently. We need to get over. It. We need to get over it. We need to get over this. We need to get over that. But then, like, most of the time, these are the same people that will turn around and be like, oh, my God, Tulsa Massacre was real? Oh, my God, Sundown Towns were a real thing? Like, oh, my God, I can't believe. Right? So shut your mouth. You guys don't even know what we've been through in this country. When he finally gets to his aunt and uncle's house, we learn that uh, Jonathan Major is our main character, that his name is Atticus, uh, and they call him Tick. His nickname is Tick. Andrew Ellis is calling him Tick Tick. And I made a note, I was like, you know, these names are very interesting, like Hippolyta, Atticus, um, I want to say these are Greek names, I'm sorry, I'm not that well versed on, you know, European culture, sorry, uh, but I want to say these are like Greek, Roman names, um, Atticus is also really interesting because it makes me think of Atticus Finch from To Kill a Mockingbird, I know that Lovecraft Country, this show is based off of a book, um, I think the dude's name is Matt Ruff? That might not be it. Whatever his name is, I don't. I'm not sure what his name is, but I don't know if this is the name of the character in the book. I'm trying to just go into the show like totally blind and just watch without any spoilers or really ideas um, outside of like the basic premise. So I don't know if these are the names of the characters in the book as well. But these are really interesting names. And then we also learn later on that Hippolyta studies the stars. So I'm, I'm really interested to see where we're going with these names and this symbolism, especially because another really large running theme uh, you can tell is going to be in the show is lineage. Lineage, legacy, claim your lineage. In the letter that his father wrote him, it was like, you need to go to this place, Lovecraft Country, where your mother's family, ancestors, heritage sort of comes from. Turns out that that's in the middle of sundown country where black Americans really cannot go. And, you know, you need to claim your legacy, you need to claim your heritage. And this is also another really similar running theme in the work of H.P. Lovecraft is a lot of these ideas about lineage, about heritage, and about legacy. And again, this is also a lot of the things that we've been talking about. You know, I've talked about this a lot for the past couple of years on my channel, that we need to be focusing more on our ethnicity, our culture, our heritage and our legacy and, you know, what are we creating and building and what are we also going to be leaving behind. So it was very interesting to kind of see this playing out in this uh, fictional way, I guess, historical fiction on this show. I was also very appreciative of the sort of black nerd <laughs> representation, like black alt representation, like his uncle George runs a bookstore, comic shop, uh, and he publishes this book himself, this road guide, um, that he travels around to, you know, review and figure out where, where it's safe for us to go, which obviously means he ends up in places where it is not safe for us to go, and there's some alluding to him getting his kneecaps, you know, broken by white people, um, but I thought that there was a lot of really interesting representation of, like, black people that are into sci-fi and speculative fiction and comics and pulp and b-movies you know his uncle is into it his aunt is into um astronomy and like looking at the stars and he's into you know he's reading a princess of mars you know and he talks about how a huge part of the disconnect between himself and his father who's now disappeared that and he wants to find him he's trying to find him especially because he wrote him this cryptic letter is that they butted heads over his love of, I'm going to say, fiction that his father knew was racist, right? So he sees Atticus at one point, we learn, reading H.P. Lovecraft, racist as H.P. Lovecraft, he, he picks up the book and he makes Atticus read a poem on the creation of niggers, right, by H.P. Lovecraft. He talk, They talk about, you know, pulp trash versus respectable literature, how his father wanted him to read respectable literature, and, you know, how he forced him to memorize this poem, The Creation of Niggers, when he caught him reading speculative fiction and sci-fi, and I just thought that that was a really interesting thing to bring into the dynamic as well, you know, a lot of the, um, tension, maybe, tension around, you know, not seeing black 
people in the future. Like, we will be there. You guys know this was a huge issue that I had with Mad Max. I just felt like, why? Like, why is all this shit, like, so fucking white? Like, we're going to be in the future. Like, we are going to be there after the apocalypse. Like, there's, we are going to be there in, in alternate realities, alternate universes. We're always going to be there. Like, we exist in sci-fi and speculative fiction. And the fact that so much sci-fi and speculative fiction, white, mainstream, is racist and is founded on racist principles and ideologies makes this sort of disconnect. So, but then you, I, I hope that we maybe, well, probably not because of the time that it's set in, but, you know, then you, we, luckily, contemporary readers, we have Octavia Butler and we even have some raw and we have, you know, a lot more to sort of choose from right now, but I thought that it was a really interesting thing for them to kind of get into and play off of. So I actually did, I just remembered that there were some things that I didn't like. Um, there was that Jordan Peele trademark of using contemporary music um, for a scene where we see um, George Freeman like walking around, like walking around Chicago. It's like 1960s Chicago, but they're playing Tierra Whack. I like Tierra Whack, but I hate this. I feel like, I don't know. I just don't like the contemporary music for period pieces. I didn't like it in that um, Netflix, um, Madam C.J. Walker. I, 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 I haven't liked the interpolations of music that Jordan Peele uses in his other movies. It's just, I don't know, it's just not for me. Like, I don't think I'm gonna like it. I don't think I'm gonna like it. Um, and I made a note, I was like, I usually don't love this. Like, we see him walking around the neighborhood in Chicago, it's set to this Tierra Wax song. We see the army there talking to kids, which I thought was a really interesting visual cue to the way that the military is very predatory in Black American communities because it's seen as, you know, one of the few ways out of poverty. I talked about this a little bit in the Black Americans um, St. Louis with Alicia. So I like that little visual knot. And they were kids. They were like kids' kids. So we see that his dad was like a drunk, drunk, like, and we find out that the last person to see his father was a woman in a nice silver Ford. So then there's this like question throughout the rest of the episode of like, what's up with this silver Ford? We end up meeting um, Journey around this time. She's his friend, Letty. We see her singing on stage with her sister, who's also a singer. I hope that there's some type of mention or discussion of colorism at some point because her sister is dark skin and she obviously is light skin. Later on, we see them. Uh, we see her with another one of their brothers that's also darker skin. So I really, I'm not gonna like put that in the bad or you know take a point off or anything like that. But I'm really hoping that there's a dive into some co the colors and issues. Like I wonder if it's gonna be so they have the same mother because there's talk about how uh, Letty, who's obviously the problem child out of the three of them, missed their mother's funeral. But she so clearly like. Like, if they have the same mother, it's like they're probably going to end up having different fathers. Maybe her father's going to end up being white. I hope that gets explained. I'm sure it will be. I hope they don't just sort of, you know, leave it. Um, but I'm sure it will be. We sort of see this dynamic between Journey's character, Letty, and her siblings. And it was sort of even serving me a little bit of, like, Queen Sugar type of vibes. Like, I'm, I'm really interested to see how we get more backstory on them and how this evolves over time. I loved the musical like the musical scene the musical number i thought uh her sister ruby was very much a nod to big mama thornton and black women rock and roll tina turner you know just like rocking out i love that it seems that journey is a photographer or something along those lines because she has this camera and it's funny because i feel like before birds of prey i had no idea that journey could sing and now apparently like she's singing in everything and i think she really has a nice voice like let me find out journey about to drop an album let me find out so it appeared to be like a neighborhood block party that they were singing at um Atticus opened the hydrant they were dancing in the water they were dancing in the street and I felt like it looked really good I felt like the visuals the aesthetic the cinematography the just the production value and the quality of the show seems like it's through the roof I'm really enjoying these kind of black period pieces I felt like the hair uh, the makeup and the costumes all looked amazing. Journey's costumes were just wonderful from beginning to end. Every single outfit they had her in, she was just, she was looking like everything. So 
we see, uh, we see, I keep saying journey. We see Letty and her sister Ruby fight. And again, I made a note of like, there better be some colorism mentioned at some point. Obviously, these sisters have contention. One is dark skin and one is light skin. So I'm curious about that. They obviously have Letty positioned as this troublemaker that only comes around when she needs something. You know, she's trying to like negotiate with Ruby on if she's going to have somewhere to stay. She's like, I'm not going to clean houses. I have no money. I want a, a good department store job. And Ruby's like, you're doing too much. Like, I'm not trying to be around all white people. Like, I'm happy here with my people. Letty, and then we learn later on from, like, the argument with her brother that Letty appears to be some type of integrationist, activist, like, and there was some type of contention also between her and their mother while she was living with her. They're really setting up some type of family dynamic to unfold within um, Journey Smollett's character and her family, which I liked as well, that she was a kind of just this sidekick to Jonathan Majors and his uncle as they sort of like set out to go look for his father. She wants to tag along so that she can go see her brother because this is the first time she's been in town for a while and she's going to go stay with him because her sister says she can only stay with her for a couple of days. But then when they get to her brother's house, they get into a huge argument about, again, how she's a troublemaker. She's an activist. She only comes around when she needs money. She's taking money. She's using money to bail people out of jail. And she didn't even attend their mother's funeral. She talked about, you know, how they have this tumultuous relationship. They're totally screaming and yelling. And then when it comes time the next day to leave her brother's house, she ends up leaving with John the Majors and his uncle. And now I feel like the stage is set for, for the three of them. I don't know how long his uncle's going to be in the picture. We'll have to see. To kind of be these companions. I felt like the bulk of the episode took place while they were on the road. Uh, his uncle George was already heading out for a trip so Jonathan Majors uh, decides to kind of tag along because he's looking for his father and he's heading that way kind of through New England. Journey tags along with them and then we have our little, you know, we have our, our golden trio here. So the bulk of the episode took place on the road. I really enjoyed this montage that they had of them traveling. They had these like map title cards with the county and the actual place, like the map behind it. And it was um, the, it was set to this voiceover of James Baldwin giving this monologue on, you know, what is the, really what is the premise of the American dream to the Negro, right? Like to the American Negro. And it's juxtaposed with them trying to take this road trip and enjoy the road and yet the racism the persistent racism that is just everywhere it's everywhere they go you know they they ride into a town and they're literally ran out of the town by firefighters with fucking shotguns at one point you know they're they're going to a, a restaurant that previously uh his uncle george had put in the book they get there it's supposed to be called lydia's they're like oh it's not this isn't the right name he says well it's the right place it's supposed to be safe for Negroes. Let's sit down. Turns out, turns out that they burned Lydia's down and they ran the owner out of town or maybe even killed her. It's, it's left kind of open-ended what happened. And then Journey overhears them talking about it when she's in the bathroom and she's like, we got to get the hell out of here. And they literally run out. They run to the car. They're ran out of town by white, you know, redneck firefighters with shotguns. We see them stopping to get gas and these white teenagers do like a monkey, like like a monkey pantomime at them. It's something that, and it's very interesting to read about this because you guys know I've also, uh, I've done cross country road trips twice. I've traveled extensively by the road. And it's really, once you do some reading up on also the history of like the great American road trip, the great American road trip was pushed as this like quintessential American thing. You know, Americana, you, you once they really started pushing to build high, highways in the United States, um, in the 1950s and really pushing for car travel there was this like concentrated effort of like you get your Ford you get your Cadillac you we have these nice smooth paved highways you can go anywhere in the country you can travel you can see the sights you can put your kids in the car it was very much the selling of the great American road trip again it's like quintessential Americana, something you have to do. And yet, even though at this time you have black Americans that were becoming upwardly mobile, they were working for the post office, they were working for government jobs, they were finally getting, you know, ex expendable income that we wanted to be able to put our families in the car and take a ride and see our, you know, nation as well. And yet, we literally can't, we're literally, we are stopped 
because of the institutionalized racism and the danger that we have to face at every corner. And the show really does not shy away from that fact and they really play up the tension, which is why it makes sense as a horror. And this is kind of this like Jordan Peele, uh, Peelian, shout out to Sizzaman, you know, this, this Jordan Peele type of thing of making racism this really ominous, tense, horror, feel and they really played it up they didn't shy away from that in the show at all we do still see them having a good time we do still see them joking around we do still see them you know driving the car but it's a very interesting montage that's juxtaposing the the road experience for one set of americans versus the road experience for another set of americans and it just gets even more exacerbated when they start really getting deep into you know, close to where they're going, which is in New England. I appreciated that this was set in New England and not in the South because they love to act like racism was only a problem in the South. It's a problem everywhere. Anti-Black racism is a problem everywhere. There were sundown towns all throughout the United States. The, where Wall Street stands right now in New York City used to be a huge slave auction, which served as the basis for the, the economy of New York, which is why Wall Street is there now, the basis of the economy in New York. Like, these are not just southern concepts or southern ideas they were everywhere and so once we see them also start getting into the sundown towns getting deep into devon county massachusetts getting deep into these into these places they they're looking for they're looking for a road they're looking for a bridge they can't find it where is it where is it where is it they pull over to get out cop pulls up on them you can't be here after sundown seven minutes till sundown i don't know if you're gonna make it follows them and it's and, but they can't speed right because he's like if you're speeding i'll be forced to pull you over and then you definitely won't make it and if you're here after sundown i'm sworn by the law to string you up Th that's the law niggas aren't allowed here you know so then we have a tense chase scene going at 20 miles per hour like the direction and the tension was so amazing so good like it was just so tight and when they finally got out you, know, you were just like finally just for them to run into what another sundown town basically and a whole line of sheriffs waiting for them including one that they read about earlier because he's a virulent virulent racist and once they run into them we're now probably in the last 20 minutes of the episode once they run into them is when the sort of the lovecraftian horror in a more literal sense i've seen people say that they feel like there wasn't enough lovecraftian horror i felt like it was actually a really really smart play on lovecraft and cosmic horror and the idea that the world is this big perpetually scary and terrifying place because it is that for us right due to racism it doesn't necessarily have to be actual monsters like yes all of this shit is monstrous for us I enjoy that. I feel like I'm the target demographic. But then at this point in the episode, we actually do get a very literal Lovecraftian turn. Because right when they're about to be basically murdered, lynched by this row of sheriffs that find them, you know, that are waiting for them uh, at night once they get off that road, they're attacked by these monsters. They're covered in eyes, which is very Lovecraftian. Like, they just look slimy and fucking disgusting. And... They fight back, they fight against them, heads are bit off, it becomes very bloody and gory here. Um, I had someone ask me if I felt like the blood and the gore was over the top. It wasn't over the top for me, and you guys know I'm not really into blood and gore. Um, it wasn't too much, and it was like pretty brief, but this is where we start getting into some blood and some gore as uh, basically all of them, except for two of them, the main sheriff and another one, are killed by these monsters. Betty and Tick, I'm gonna really try and call them by their names and not call them Journey and Jonathan Majors. Letty and Tick run away. We find out that Letty uh, used to run track. They run away and they take shelter in this cabin with the two um, white dudes and his uncle accidentally sort of gets left behind. But he ends up getting away as well. They realize that the monsters are sort of uh, sensitive to light. Letty runs she, to get the car. She crashes the car into the cabin. Of course, the super, super, super racist sheriff gets bitten and he starts like turning. It's kind of like zombie, vampire. There's all this blood. There's all these monsters. They got guns. I loved it. It was like pulpy, action, horror with these black American protagonists, you know, and these white races getting eaten. I thought it was super fun. 
even though it was bloody and gory and horror, it was super fun and campy. I, I enjoyed it. It was kind of, it was like a, a culmination of everything that we saw in the episode up until this point. Uh, and then they end up getting away. Of course, now they magically find the road that they were looking for earlier. They walk down it. They get to this house. Oh, what do they see? A motherfucking silver Ford, which I forgot to mention. They also saw earlier in the episode when they were being chased out of the town, um, by the firefighters, they end up getting saved by a mysterious silver Ford that somehow like flips the whole truck that's following them over. They end up getting to the house of, of the people, I guess, that own it. It's like a white woman and a white dude. They open the door. They tell Jonathan Majors, welcome home. We've been waiting for you. That part was super, super Watchmen to me, like very cryptic, very mysterious. No idea what this is referencing. And that was episode one. Other things of note that I wanted to mention in this episode, uh, in terms of the visual cues, when they were doing their travel montage, there were several scenes that were meant to be setups of very famous um, Gordon Parks photographs, a very super famous photograph of a black woman and her daughter standing in front of a colored only entrance. I believe the picture was originally black and white, but it ended up being colorized uh, with these like green this like green dress and they they had like a um like a visual nod to that like we saw a black woman and her daughter leaning over it kind of like they staged it uh there was another one with a line of black americans waiting at a bus stop in front of a huge billboard that said you know something like you know american dream america's future is is on the road again a part of this like push for road travel and tying that to the american dream and these american values and upward mobility and all of these things that black americans are expressly you know left out of as the sort of bottom cast in the united states that's a famous photograph they showed a visual nod to that with these black people standing in line at a bus stop underneath the billboard um those are the two that are coming to mind right now, but I know they did like at least a few of those type of visual setup that if you know the photograph that they're referencing, you're like, oh, I, I know that, that photograph. I know what they're referencing there. Um, I also loved that the daughter of uh, George Freeman uh, and Anjanou Ellis, Hippolyta D, that she draws. She's an artist. She like draws these comics. Uh, about her father or and for her father you know her road her road comics for when he's like going out and taking his trips and she's just this wonderful artist I love that even when they were leaving out she gave them a map and right in you know Lovecraft Country she drew a fucking Grim Reaper on there with this like ominous foreshadowing loved that we learned that as children Letty and Tick belong to the South Side Futurists Science Fiction Club love that I really like this mix of historical fiction and this use of, you know, a fictional premise to make a historical point. I think they're doing a really good job of that. I feel like it's grounded enough in reality, even with the fantastical elements like the monsters and this and that, that I feel like it's grounded enough in reality that it's still respectful. It's not like some of these other things that we've come out recently with Harry Tubman with the Spidey sense and all this shit, that they're making it seem as if like our stories and our lives and our past are not real, like as if they are just completely speculative fiction, you know, made up. I feel like there's like a really concentrated effort to fictionalize what happened to us to sort of like turn it into like metaphor or allegory or, you know, revise it, revisionist history. But I felt like, and I had concerns um, about this, you know, like, oh, how is this gonna go? But I felt like it was grounded enough in reality that it was respectful. And there were several scenes that I felt like, you know, we're still having some of these issues to this day. You know, scenes where they're driving, they're blaring music, the white people are staring at them, they're looking back. It's like there's a time, you know, it's like there's a target on our backs at all times. And in a lot of ways, it can feel like has anything changed? Black people riding in a car with the music too loud. It's how Jordan Davis got killed. Too loud according to a white person that doesn't even know you but feels like they have dominion over you, ownership over you, that they are your master, right? So the music's too loud. That's how Jordan Davis got killed. And yet I'm watching this show and I see a similar situation that's set 50, 60, 70 years, you know, prior to now. Very clear points that they're making with visual cues and context on this show, which is hard to do. 
the scene where they first walk in the diner and they realize that it that it's you know or is it the same people is it not the same people they walk in and a white patron walks out oh should we be here George Freeman says, we have every right to be here. We're citizens. You're a veteran, for God's sake. You know, and it's just like, I still know that feeling. Like, the fuck? Like, we belong to be here, too. Like, we are fucking citizens. Like, you can't run us the fuck up out of here. Like, we're fucking here, bitch. Like, that's it. So they made a lot of, like, really conscious decisions that I think are going to resonate with a lot of the Black American population contemporary, the contemporary Black American population, and with a lot of what we're talking about right now, a lot of the conversations that we're having right now. I also thought some very interesting choices were made in terms of the sort of indirect comparisons to the Lovecraft monsters and racism and the police. Like the scene where they do stop in the woods because they're looking for the bridge, they start talking about H.P. Lovecraft and they start talking about monsters in the woods and wolves and bears and that there's been uh, stories and tales, not reports, not tales, not like made up but how there's been like reports of people being attacked in those woods and they're talking about it and you know right as Atticus is saying oh it's a shogun it's like a shogun that lives in these woods which is a H.P. Lovecraft monster as he's saying it we can see within the frame because we can see the whole frame we can see the road behind them they're facing the camera so we can't they can't see what's behind them but we the audience can right as he says like it's a shogun we see the sheriff car pull up and we see the sheriff get out So very much making this connection between monsters, the police, white people, racism, these American ideologies and dreams, and, you know, they're, they're making connections. They're making connections for the audience so that we can follow along with the point of the story and the plot and where this is going. And it, again, that's something that's really hard to do well. And I think that they really, really, really did a good job of pulling it off. So I think my favorite thing about this pilot episode was the the campiness of it, the B-movie pulp, especially since it's very meta because um, we know that Tick is into camp B-movie science fiction pulp. So it's very meta to also have that kind of be the style of the show. I love that. I love that all of our Black main characters are into science and that's something that we're never allowed to forget. It repeatedly shows up. Uh, his uncle George at one another point in the show references like Bree Bradbury. Like I love that that's something that we continue to be reminded of that they're all into science and science fiction and the stars and comics and I love that. I love the references, of course, to the real life. You know, history. Even though, you know, what does it mean that people d- didn't know that Tulsa massacre, you know, Wall Street, Black Wall Street massacres and sundown towns and Negro motorist guidebooks existed before HBO shows told them what does that fucking say about people? But I like the sort of mix, you know, the use of historical fiction, the sort of mix of, you know, real life um, with this fictionalized premise to make a point about racism as horror. I, I think they're doing that really, really well. So shout out to Misha Green. I love that they put this black woman at the helm of this project. And I think that she did an amazing first job with this first episode. And I'm really, really looking forward to seeing where this goes. It seems like there's gonna be a lot of twists and turns. Again, I'm going into it totally blind, um, deliberately. I, I don't know what, really what the book is about or what this is about. I kind of just wanna experience it and then maybe I'll read the book later. But I'm, I'm really excited by this show. Uh, I feel very much like I can trust her at the helm of this show. So I also, in addition to the fact that I loved how campy it was um, and how hard sci-fi it was, really hard, hard sci-fi, they didn't really shy away from, you know, some of the elements of of the monsters that are uncomfortable. Like the whole point of cosmic horror is that it creeps you out makes the skin crawl on the back of your neck like there's something about it that just like really creeps you out on a base level on a a subconscious level on a on a just like in the back of your mind and that is racism that is institutionalized racism that is systemic racism that is the matrix it's the feeling that something is wrong but you're not 100 percent sure what it is until you know and then you're like that's what the fuck it is and i love that they didn't shy away from how extreme the racism was. We literally see them get chased out of town. Like, we see that. We literally see them in a sundown town and the sheriff says, you know, 
uh, say pretty please since I'm such a smart nigger that can I can I leave sir very like harsh horrible brutal horrific dehumanizing like they do not shy away from it they don't shy away from it they show it and I think that that's something that people need to see right now and always so I I really like and I mean and, and that could be a hard thing to balance the brutality of American racism with like can't be sci-fi B movie you know that it can seem Maybe it could seem jarring if it wasn't done well. It could seem like, are we making fun of racism? Like, are we laughing at racism? But it definitely wasn't anything like that. It really feels like Misha Green has a handle on the tone. To me, and like she has a handle on the material. And like she has a really good idea of, you know, what type of notes uh, to strike for us to really understand and grasp the concept in a respectful way. I just, I really appreciate it a lot. I'm really looking forward to episode two, which comes on. Today, it's Sunday, uh, and I am, starting next week, I'm going to be doing reviews on Saturday. This review was supposed to go up yesterday. I just didn't get the chance because I was moving. So, uh, let me know what you guys think. Who for that, as always, see you guys next time. Peace.